Our next speaker, Tom Marsick, is somebody that I've known for a very long time. First as a doctoral student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, what really I remember about Tom more than anything is how kind he was. Um, he was somebody that was extremely generous and kind. He, he was willing to lend a hand and help out um, anybody that really uh, needed one. And I, I really remember that about Tom specifically. And when Tom left and moved to Dillingham to become an assistant professor of sustainable energy at the Bristol Bay campus, um, I was a little surprised that that was the career path that he had chosen, but he has, uh, he has really excelled and done some incredible and amazing things out there, uh, both personally and professionally. I think we're going to hear about some of those personal achievements that tie into his professional life tonight. Um, but Tom, it's a real pleasure to have you back here in Fairbanks, and we're looking forward to hearing a little bit about your home tonight. So please welcome Tom Marsick. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about an extremely energy efficient home that my wife and I built in Dillingham, Alaska. Our heating bill last year was about $100 for the entire year. Just to clarify what I mean by extremely energy efficient. It's because the majority of the heat comes from body heat and other internal heat gains. So if you want to come visit, make sure it's in winter so we can take advantage of your body heat. But first of all, why would anybody want to build an energy efficient home? Obviously, it will reduce energy use, it will save you money, it will save the environment, it will save resources, it will increase the value of your home, and it will help you get ready for the long-term future. Because when you build a home, it's likely going to be here for a very long time. If you build it well, it's not unreasonable to think that it's going to be here for 100 years or longer. And your guess is as good as mine where the oil prices are going to be in 100 years, but I'm guessing they are going to be up. On the short term, we have seen some ups, ups and downs, but in the long term, the oil prices have been going up. And it's partly because it's getting more and more difficult to extract the resources from the ground. And it is much easier to build a home energy efficient right at the beginning, as opposed to having to go back and retrofit it in the future when the oil prices get higher. Now, is energy efficiency the only factor? It is not, and it's well summarized in this graph from another graph, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's well summarized in this graph from the Department of Energy that looked at the trends in the residential sector over a period of about 20 years. And let's not worry about the details in the graph, but I want to highlight three things. The first thing I want to highlight is the red line. And the red line shows the energy use per square foot for an average home in the United States. And as you look at it, it went down by about 10% over the period of about 20 years. So that's a good thing. We can say we are using a more efficient building technology. But at the same time, when you look at the yellow line, that shows the average square footage that went up by about 20% during the same period. Now, that coupled with other factors, such as the fact that now these bigger homes are occupied by fewer people, resulted in the total increase in the primary energy use in the residential sector in the USA by about 35%. And all that while we decreased the energy use per square foot by about 10%. So when we look at this data, and if we agree that it's important to decrease the energy consumption of homes, I think it's a fair question to ask, well, what good does it do to increase the energy efficiency of homes if it is outweighed by escalations in their size? And so that's one of the questions that we try to address with our project. So the house that we built is a relatively small house, uh, given American standards at least. Now many people would say, bigger is better, isn't it? Not necessarily. I have some interesting data. The happiest country in the world is Denmark. This is based on a survey initiated by the United Nations. The USA ranks 17. Now the average size of a home in Denmark 
is close to 1,000 square feet smaller than it is in the United States. And I know this is not an exact science. There are other factors that affect happiness. But I would like to at least offer the idea that maybe smaller homes could make us happier. And I see, <laughs> I see some practical reasons for that, just from my own experience. We love living in our home. And by not having to maintain and clean a big home, I can spend the time on more meaningful things, like playing with my daughter. So smaller might actually mean better. Here's our house. It's a relatively simple house. Simple is good, in my opinion. The outside dimensions are 24 feet by 24 feet. It's a two-story building envelope. It has 28 inches thick walls. So as you can imagine, the interior is significantly smaller than the exterior. <laughs> it has two bedrooms, one bathroom. Simple is good. So when you look at this conceptual drawing, the basic idea behind the design is a really simple idea. I call it the box in a box technique. So the way the house is built is that it's the external house and then the internal house built inside the external house. So a box in a box. And that leaves the cavity between those two houses. And that cavity, in our case, is, is filled with cellulose insulation. Cellulose is a very environment-friendly type of material made from recycled paper. We have about seven tons of that in, in our house. And so this design has several advantages. One of them is that by having this basically separate inside and external framing, you have basically no thermal bridging. So you have no lumber going from the inside to the outside, like you have in a conventional structure for the rafters, for example. Also, by having this simple internal box, you are working with a simple surface that you can wrap in this screen, which acts as a vapor barrier and an air barrier at the same time. So you are basically closing the whole inside box in a plastic bag. That's how you can look at it. And that's how we get it so super tight. So this is how this house officially became the most airtight residential building in the world, thanks to this technique. Super insulation works. Here's a thermal image taken with an infrared camera. Just to kind of, in a simplified way, what the colors mean, the darker color means less heat loss. As you can see, our house has significantly less heat loss than a normal house. Besides being extremely airtight and extremely insulated, it has some other interesting energy features. The design heating load and the design temperature for Dillingham is minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. So the design heating load is about 1.4 kW, which is less than a hair dryer, to put it into perspective. So a hair dryer would be more than sufficient to keep the house warm at minus 22 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. It has a heat recover ventilator. That's a mechanical ventilation system that takes the heat from that warm still air that's going out and transfers it into that fresh, fresh cold air that is coming in. So despite the fact that it's an extremely airtight home, we have plenty of fresh air without significant heat loss. There's a heat pump for water heating, another for space heating, and it's an entirely electric house. So there is no wood pile, there is no propane tank, there is no oil tank no combustion whatsoever, which also makes it healthier and safer. A few pictures about how we build it. We build the external house first, which was an advantage in the rainy weather in Dillingham, because then we're building the inside out of the weather, and it went much faster. The upper left picture shows that cavity between the inside and outside box. So that's what, what was filled with the cellulose Insulation, we blew it, by the way, one day before our wedding, which was, which was in the house. So we had a real, real incentive to, to get it done because we wanted to have a wedding in a, in a warm house. And yes, we did get married while building a house. You probably know couples who get divorced while building a house. So, so, so we, we did the opposite. I thought we did pretty well. And then the bottom picture shows some pictures of the finished interior. More pictures of the finished interior. What I like to point out that it's not just an extremely energy efficient house, it's also healthy and environment friendly. 
So, for example, the walls and the ceiling are painted with a zero volatile organic compound paint, which means it's not of gassing toxic chemicals like normal paints do. The kitchen cabinets and the flooring is bamboo, which is a rapidly renewable resource. The countertops are from recycled glass. So I mentioned that the majority of the heat comes from internal heat gain. Here's a breakdown of that. The byproduct heat from lighting and appliances supply about 40% of the needed heat. Body heat supplies about 22%, and the passive solar gain supplies about 14%, so the sunshine coming in through our windows. And that leaves about 24% that needs to be supplied from a heat source. It's a very small amount. If we were using oil, we would need about 35 gallons of heating oil annually. We are not using oil, this is just for perspective. We are using the heat pump which operates on electricity. So how much does it cost to operate our home compared to an average home in Dillingham? An average home in Dillingham pays over $5,000 annually for the heating fuel and electricity. In our house, we have no heating fuel, zero. And our electric bill is less than $1,000. So you are looking at savings over $4,000 annually, thanks to for one, having a smaller house size, and for two, using this extremely energy efficient construction technology. Does it cost more to build at super efficient homes? Yes, it does, if you compare it to the same size and everything else being the same, but the main components are the same regardless of energy efficiency. You clean the land, you need a driveway, you need the plumbing, electrically, you need a well. So what I highlighted in green is that empty building itself. And that empty building itself was about $60,000 in material. Out of that, about $20,000 is for insulation. So that's quite a bit of money for insulation. But at the same time, when you think about insulation, it's something, if you install it well, that's going to need no maintenance and that's going to last basically forever. So in the long term, you are looking at significant savings. So what if you are not interested in saving money? What if you are rich? Well, there's still the environment and there are those finite resources that we use to build and operate our homes. And the lives of future generations are in our hands, quite literally. It's, it's up to us how much we choose to take and how much we choose to leave for them. I am choosing to do my best to save the environment and the finite resources for our kids and grandkids. Will you join me? Yes. Thank you.